Charles is actually quite the accomplished musician. Uh, very extensively trained and he's done his time in the trenches uh, with the live gigs and such. And so uh, I, I, I've heard some of, uh, I don't know if I've heard his music directly or he was talking about something he played for uh, a final piece and it was just a mind-boggling bass line. So uh, very, very interesting. So yeah, if you get the chance to get Miles uh, on a call sometime, you need to kill a couple of minutes, uh, just start asking about guitars. Yeah. Ask, him how, ask him how it's going with Reverb.com. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I, I have this uh, theory that, that I've um, held on to through my career is that when you find a really good IT person, you will also find a musician or an artist of some kind. Yeah. So I challenge everybody on the call today, like think it through. Of all the great IT people you have known, did they play a musical instrument or were they some form of artist? And uh, it's always been the case for me, definitely with programmers. And I think it's just that, that creative mind, that part of their brain is active. So they're able to think it through which kind of segues into this week's topic of provisioning employees and like, how do you, how do you find the right employee as well as, um, <clears throat> yeah, music is an expression of math. Um, There's the nerd. There's the nerd. Unfortunately, <laughs> you don't get into that creative mathematics until like college, because in high school, it's all rote memorization and very analytical versus in college, it starts becoming this creative expression when you're getting into like Taylor series and different, um, <laughs> and when you get to different ways of being creative with mathematics, but by then you've scared away all the creative types. <laughs> Anyways, today, today it's provisioning employees and um, I'm gonna do something today I haven't done in a long time and that's the whiteboard. Oh, oh. because- well, Let's see, uh, we, we'll take odds, ha ha have his, have his crayon skills increased any since we last oh. saw? <laughs> you can actually take classes in this stuff, <laughs> um, but I don't know. Eh. Anyways, um, the visual storytelling classes are quite expensive. I don't need them. I've got my I've got my pen. Anyways, the pull it out of your pocket. The problem with provisioning employees is is that we tend to throw people at problems rather than finding the right problems to give to people. I'll let that sink in just for a second. And uh, when we're talking about the strategic analysis, we're talking about service delivery. Really what we're talking about is what services do we need to deliver to our clients and who's going to deliver that? Often we're like, oh, well, we need somebody who can turn over tickets that can fix mice, but that can fix blah, 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 because it's a discrete problem in our head. But what's the actual problem our clients are facing? So when you've gone through the service audit and you've had the conversation with the key stakeholders, what is the actual problem facing your clients? And how do you identify who to hire or what employees to work on that? And the, uh, the answer is just those key stakeholder interviews. <laughs> Always hired for DNS. Uh, <laughs> so Bob says, the, <laughs> um, the provisioning of employees is difficult because most of us do not do roles and responsibilities. So when we have a problem that gets identified in a service audit, we just throw it to the person who's closest to the problem. So we have some, we have a client who complains about network outages all the time. Okay, hand it to the network team. We have a client who complains about printers not being available all the time. Okay, fine, that's, uh, which team is that? Do you have a printer team? Probably not, so let's, move them over to the PC techs, you know? And so what, what does it mean to actually provision an employee and assign them the right tasks? And that, what does it mean to actually have the right problem that you can hire the appropriate people for that? And so there's a lot of matrices out there put out by ConnectWise, by IT Glue, by Infotech, by Gartner on what your employee ratio should be, how many techs should you have per engineer, we have some people who just hire engineers. They won't hire techs. We have some people who believe in very, very robust first level support. And we need to figure out what does this mean for us? And that's why I'm gonna go into 
one of my favorite um, topics is how do you divide up work so that you know who to hire next? And how do you identify the correct problem so you hand it to the right employees? Okay. Hmm. I'm all ears. I'm here. I think I need to highlight my, uh, I'm going to try something different today. Spotlight for everyone. Boom. Oh, there you go. Some days I can do some cool things. So <laughs> what I what I divide things up into, and I think Bob's probably the person who's gotten this particular talk the most of anybody on this call, is uh, I divide things into three layers when it comes to employee provisioning. I always have. Even with um, corporate or MSPs, or if I am just doing a nonprofit diagnosis of a SWAT, I will bring up this topic. So, right. top and so let me let me jump here. As as Adam goes through this, uh, what he's going to show you is also a direct correlation in your your client's environment. So while you think about, we're talking internal today, but there's obviously very clear parallels that exactly match with your clients. So we need to keep those in mind as well. Okay. All right. So what we have is we have, th we're gonna have three basic levels. And then we're going to talk about how the four pillars apply to that. So down here, we have operations. This is where most of you live, eat and breathe. This is where almost all your employees exist. This is where your, uh, your high level engineers are. This is where your uh, techs are. This is where um, you know any of your account managers probably operates into this level. Anything to do with the architecture audit you did first quarter or the services, like what can they do? I'm a network guy, I'm a server guy, I am a PC uh, gal. Whatever they are, this is where they exist because this is the tactical area. This is the area that actually gets moved to the cloud most often. Then we up here at the very tippy top, we have the strategy side of things. <clears throat> and this is where the CEO is. And she is usually up here having a good time talking about how am I going to grow my business? Down here, we have the engineers and the accountants and stuff supporting the business. In an MSP up here, instead, we have the CIO. And their job is to make sure that the operations and the engineering and everybody is working on the appropriate tasks to help the corresponding CEO with your client. There's a whole big area in the middle here that gets ignored by almost every MSP I work with and Skip works with and that we have seen because no one likes paperwork. <laughs> uh, well, okay, some people do. This is the area where largely project management occurs. A project manager's job is to translate the strategic vision into tactical goals. This is also where the reports exist. The architecture report, the risk report, service report and the strategic report, except for the strategic report does not exist down here. Where is he at, Skip? Top level. Top level, he's up here with the CIO. So, ooh, we need an E. <laughs> I've never Space put it in this order before, but man, um, we might have to change our entire um, framework just to have an arse. <laughs> I was going for Aries, so. Oh, that'd be I. <laughs> oh, I guess A-R-E-S. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, let's call it, well, yeah, we'll refer to this to the Bob. <laughs> but anyways, what I'm trying to get at here is like, when you're auditing your clients when you're trying to discuss with them who stars nice mm -hmm. um when trying to discuss which stars you use for alignment to figure out where you're going to go sextant anyways um <clears throat> 
when you're looking at provisioning employees and deciding who you need to hire and who needs to go to which project, you have to determine what is going on with your client because every client needs has different needs. And so when you are up here as a CIO and you're talking to the CEO and the CEO says, hey, um, the, the, the goal for our company this year is that we wanna grow by 20%. We traditionally grow by about seven to 10. We think we can grow by 20% if we can get um, a better way for people to watch their dogs from their workplace. So we are a kennel, we're a, board, we're a boarding kennel. And so can you guys figure out a way to get this done? And so the CIO goes, well, I need to know more about your infrastructure. And so he's going to create this middle layer. Let me discover, he's not talking about what to deliver, he should, the, the, the problem that most people do is they immediately think, oh, more webcams, which means more infrastructure. And so they'll, they'll jump over the middle section and they'll go right down and find a tech or an engineer to say, hey, we need uh, 30 more webcams and a uh, network can have this capacity, blah, blah, blah. And they immediately run down that rabbit hole. A CIO instead uses the middle layer. A CIO delegates these audits for architecture, we need to figure out what's gonna go on here. Tell me what's going on with architecture. Tell me where their risks are. Do they have a PCI compliant uh, network that we need to be worried about? Do they have um, uh, <clears throat> physical areas that people can get into really easily because they're a kennel, they're outdoor and indoor. Do they have weather concerns, blah, blah, blah. Services, do we have people managing them appropriately? So he's gonna paint this picture really quickly and he's gonna take all of this and he's gonna feed it up into strategy. Now you guys should all be very familiar with this concept. So now the CIO has a, has a understanding of the environment and he's got this problem that he's working on, how to get more visibility to clients. And he may discover that, oh my gosh, we haven't updated their switches in 10 years. They're still running on 100 meg uh, switches and there's no way they'll handle that high def output. Uh, their, um, their, their uplink to the internet is way under provisioned. And those have been the, that, that would have been where they would stop. That's what would happen if you would have jumped over it. But in the meantime, these PMs are in here going and looking at this and going, hey, by the way, they also need to be able to lock down their webcams and they need some weatherproof ones because the number of kennels outdoors and around their little uh, dog pool, well, they're gonna need like four just right there. And then the service people say, wait a minute, if they have all these new webcams, we know they have a fail rate of around 10%. Um, we're gonna need to deal with that. But also we know that they tend to have problems with printing and tend to have problems with this and this and this, and they're gonna feed back up this stuff. So now you're getting a more cohesive picture from these different areas that are going to feed not just the architecture, but also how you're going to maintain this environment. And so now you've got a complete picture from the CIO standpoint before you even went to engineering and solved the problem. Because the engineers just went through and they audited all this stuff the security people went through and all of all this stuff and the service people audit all this stuff. The project managers kind of been watching this or so in some of your guys' companies, this is actually the account manager. Project manager I'm using as a loose term as somebody who's just in the middle of coordinating work and efforts amongst teams. He's dividing this up, making sure it gets done, making sure timelines are met. So if you find yourself in an MSP who's constantly missing deadlines, it's because you're missing this. That's why you're missing deadlines. You're good at what you do. You're really good at fixing things, but you don't have anybody managing this middle layer and making sure that these tasks here are divided up appropriately and the timelines are managed based upon the CEO and what they want. And so when you're provisioning this work, the account manager and the PM are sitting there in the middle. It's your middle-level manager. Those are your team leads, uh, their account managers, whoever they are. And they're feeding this down and they're getting feedback back up through the reports. And now you've got this picture like, okay, here's how we can do it. So now the CIO goes, tell you what, we can fix this problem, but I need you to upgrade your service level to a managed network service level. 
because you've had problems in the past with this and you've fallen behind. But once we do this, we cannot be at a service level where we're doing ad hoc. We have to be on board with this. So I need you to buy um, the managed network package that we own so that we are constantly in there patching and keeping these switches up to date. The risk people want to ensure that we divide your network appropriately so your kiosks are not on the same network as your um, as your webcams because we know for a fact that a couple of years ago webcams were used for to DDoS large sites. They were a lot of them got hacked and we don't want that on the same network as, as your kiosks and your critical business functions. Finally, what we need to do is we need to upgrade some of your architecture. So now the CIO has this big picture and he's able to say, it will cost you X dollars a month and it'll cost you X dollars up front, but you will have the, the uh, network you need and it will be maintainable. If you don't do these things, then you're gonna end up buying a bunch of equipment that won't work long-term. So you painted a large picture and the CEO goes, that's fantastic. I know we can grow by 10%. That's an extra $200,000 a year for our company and we can make that decision. So go ahead and get that done, have it done by June. And so then the CIO kicks it down to the PM and says, we need to have this done by June. That's when their busy season happens because that's when everybody starts going on vacations and they start boarding their animals. Uh, and then by August, we want to have the long-term viability tested and burned through so that the people when they get back to their work environments, they can board their animals and they can watch them from home playing out with their little chewy toys. So now you've, the CIO has had no conversations about what type of webcam is being used, no conversations about what um, servers are being used or any switches that are being used. He has only pitched the idea of the solution. These people understand what the, what the uh, hardware is, what the software is and what the service levels are. So do these people. And by the time we get to here, the up to the CEO status, they don't care. So when now when you say we have bought it, now you know what to provision. You know what employees need to be there. So that when you say, hey, we're gonna install 30 new webcams for this company and it's going to do X, Y, and Z, we, can, we have them divided up into these boxes. Like which of these boxes is already full of employees? So the project manager or the account manager looks at those boxes and says, Look, um, if we add 30 webcams on and they increase their service level over here, we need somebody who's going to be able to check in and upgrade those things on a regular basis. And we're, we're already all full there. And so now, you know, you need to hire somebody who's really good at patching and who are good at, really good at maintaining webcams. Maybe it's that your, your risk audit that you're going to have to do on a quarterly basis for PCI compliance is going to push you over the edge. Maybe your architecture, you have now have too many devices and not enough engineers to maintain those network devices. You now have divided up and have a clear picture of how to hire a new one, new person, if there is a gap. You also have a way of dividing up the work into the appropriate teams. Because in your MSP, if you provisioned out and said, hey, I just want uh, network engineers to work on this, they're not gonna look at the security. They're not going to look at that aspect of it. They're not going to look at servicing it. They're just going to look at how do I get the webcams in place and do a good job of it. They don't care about these other boxes. And then four months down the road with these 30 webcams in place, and we discover we're not keeping up on them and they're constantly failing. And now the customer's unhappy. Why? Because we did not upgrade the service model. And that's, that's, that's the complexity of provisioning employees is delegating their work to the right ones and hiring the right ones based upon need and future status. This, this is my, this is my, uh, I will, I will give this talk until the end of time. I actually have a recorded video of this on the channel where we talk it through. And I, I say, here's how you move things up and down the verticals. This is why we have the pillars. They are more than just a way to, whoa, they're more than just an easy way to divide up and visualize data. They're also a way to help you understand where you need to hire more people or what kind of person you need to hire. For small shops, you're like, huh, person in each one of these roles, I can't afford that. You are correct. 
but you can say, hey, I need somebody at the project management level and I need to be able to do it 30% of the time. So now you can build your roles and responsibilities appropriately. Well, Adam, that, that's actually really important there because what we look at that and, you know, um, when, when we build out our assessments, you know, working with a lot of you guys, you know, customizing your assessments and you're going through and you're, you're identifying these things, we're talking about architecture elements, we're talking about risk elements and services elements um, and, and all these different things. And we have to make sure there is a, a consistency. A balance is important, but I would say a, a thorough consistency. Let me put modify that. A thorough consistency of all of these categories, because if if you tackle architecture and risk, okay, those are two of the hot topics, I guess, that, that we see. But you don't focus on how they're executing the, the, the services. I mean, what is actually being done there, then, then you leave yourself open to all of these issues that don't get addressed. I mean, it, it's sometimes, you know, when you ask a question, you know, you want, you have an answer that you want, you know, yes or no, that, that, that you know, whatever it is you're trying to get out of it. But no answer is sometimes worse, right? And that's what we get into when we don't look at and divide these up and, and see where it's appropriate, where we can allocate things. Because if we're just ignoring the services, we're going to create problems. We're going to have tickets coming in from the bottom. People aren't, the technology is there, but they're not able to use it right. We have an architecture engineer who's trying to really modify a process. Uh, they just don't do it well. And then the CEO gets un, you know, upset because they feel nothing works right, all right? And it's actually all working perfectly. They just aren't executing the services right. So this idea of categorizing this and ad identifying uh, you know, what your clients need and what you can provide go hand in hand so that we leave nothing off. It, we, the risk, like that's a, a clear one. I mean, you've heard me mention it many times. You start pulling on that thread of risk, you know, how deep do you go? That you can, you can, you know, spend forever down at the bottom of the ocean on diving into risk. Maybe that's not the route to go, but, you know, at least acknowledging that we have all of these different areas and not leaving them undone is, is really, really important. Yeah, and the, the the biggest the biggest hurdle that a lot of you are guys are experiencing is one is finding hot quality employees to fill roles, especially when you're in a startup mode, when you're a smaller mode where you only have like three, five people in your MSP. You look at this and you go, that's too much. I, I cannot do all that. You're right, but you already are doing it. You just you just haven't divided up the roles and responsibilities. Yeah. So you don't recognize the breadth of services that you are offering. If you're a one man shop, you're doing all of this by yourself. These are the different places. So if you look at the quadrants that Skip and Miles and Danish talk about, you're doing all four of those by yourself. Now, who do you hire in the future? Who do you want? Where do you want to get rid of things? Like I want to stop managing projects. I really hate doing that. So I hire somebody with project management skill set. I define that role so I can hire it. And then maybe someday that, that project manager says, I am overworked. I'm like, well, what area is too busy for you? And they say, I am doing so much service, so many service audits and managing like those compliance levels or managing um, SLAs that I need somebody just to manage this. So you know to hire somebody over here and you can set that up. But if you don't recognize this as going on in your business, you'll just hire and hire and hire and you'll constantly get more and more engineers that are doing really good at their jobs, but overall, you're not accelerating beyond the competition. You're just acting like any other MSP. And if that's the case, you're in a low bid game now and everybody loses that game. Yep. Every time until some big shop comes in, can underbid everybody and everybody goes out of business. This instead allows you to grow smart and intelligently so that when people do business with you, you are reliable and you are way above the competition because you have appropriately provisioned people in the right roles and you are sending the right tickets to the right people, not because you followed some streamlined process, but because you understand your company and how it works, how you do business and where your gaps are so that your unique value proposition gets reflected in your organizational growth. 
And whether you're at one employee or you're at 100 employees, this is how it works. This scales all the way up. It just becomes more complex because now you have 10 people over here instead of just one. Or maybe you decide as your MSP that you don't even want to do this role in your MSP, so you outsource it to a security uh, partner. But you still have to fill the role. You still have to have somebody doing this because if you don't, you'll have the gap. You'll have that problem that, that uh, hey, we installed all those new webcams. Three months down the road, the client is unhappy. Why? Because we missed things. Because we didn't get the point. We did not hit their goal. And this is how you avoid this. This is, that, that, this is, a, this is a passion thing of mine. I, I love talking about provisioning employees. I love organizational behavior stuff. It, it's weird. It's just something I love reading about. I love talking about it. because, And it's often just overlooked because we think that everybody just can do their job and they'll be okay. But if you set them up for failure by, hey, there's too much work going in one direction and not enough people to support, ugh, we've all been in that situation. Yeah. That's how absolutely. you avoid it. You provision by dividing things up so that you have, you can, uh, Tell who's doing what at any given time. If you're a traction person, you know whose eyes to look into for a problem. And you know when you kick off a project, you know that it's going to be, have a comprehensive audit behind it. That's why we have our four pillars. If you do all four of those, every project will have a comprehensive view. And every time you look at it, you're going to get the constant feedback from your employees. And you're going to be able to paint a good picture for your customers. And everybody will be happy. And if you're shorthanded in an area, it'll become readily apparent very quickly. Yep. Any follow-up things there, Skip? Well, I mean, just, you know, as you're going through and looking at your organization, run, run a quick assessment against your own organization, you know, and, and you can figure that out. I mean, your architecture guys, all right, those, those are the ones that have the CCMPs, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. What about your risk guys, all right? Well, you, maybe you got a CISO on staff or whatever, you know, there, there's a focus there. Um, your, your, your top level guys, your, your strategy guys there. I mean, those are the ones that, that have the MBAs uh, or, you know, we begin to, at that top level, we begin to kind of lose some of the titles there and we just look at, you know, past experiences. These people are business minded. This is an entrepreneur. They've started four businesses. This is someone who's always asking the business questions. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's the strategy to that person. But uh, we go through that process and I essentially left out services because I think we ignore that one sometimes, all right? We, we get so focused on selling a solution, installing a solution, uh, and then moving on to the next solution that we forget about the execution of that. You know, are the clients using the solutions? Are they using all of your solutions, all the solutions they've bought? Are they really getting the value out of it? And to, to really drive this example home, think about when you have a really, really good dispatcher all right someone who understands what people need and they understand the technical resources that you have and this person listens to a call they're triaged they're understanding the situation they identify what someone's trying to do with technology and then they match them up with someone who can make that happen for them all right when your organizations have really really good dispatchers things are a whole lot better am i am i right all right, so uh, think about that services solution. Do you need more dispatchers? Sometimes the answer is yes. Or can we make those dispatchers more effective? What are some additional resources we can put that are in that, that strategy pillar, uh, I mean, sorry, that services pillar of enabling our solutions, enabling the services that our clients get, right? When you address all of those Everything works so much better. I mean, think about your, your, your architecture guys. I mean, they gripe and complain when they keep getting tickets that aren't their responsibility, right? When the dispatcher can't do their job, right? The architecture guys are upset. Well, now we actually have problems in two pillars of our organization. It's not just an architecture problem. It's not just a services problem. It's in both now, all right? But if we can fix it in one, then we can probably fix it in the other too. So don't ignore all of these elements. We have to look at them. We're not going to have the same number of people in each of those uh, pillars. That's okay. We just need to make sure that the workload is, is each, each of those pillars is being handled with the appropriate workload. Yep. 
And Mike is Mike is uh, messaging here in chat saying this this works. Like he's been doing this in his own MSP to uh, to grow things and to offload tasks from himself. And if you're a if you're a owner of an MSP and you feel like there's there's no end game, if you feel like this is, that you're just there's no way to delegate because no one can do what you do, this is the answer. Uh, this works. And we can prove that it works. It's worked many times. And Mike is just one example of where he delegates and trains and then works and then brings up the next employee and puts them in the right role so that they can be put into the right place. And eventually you, you think, okay, now I've got these, these people running on my operations and things are going smoothly. Man, I'm really tired of managing the project deadlines. Now you hire a project manager. Now you have a new role, but you start mentoring them, knowing that your operations is going smoothly. You start mentoring the, the new project manager on how you do things and your own flavor of things. And eventually they start taking that off. And after a while, you're sipping my ties on the beach because your organizational behavior and your style of doing things has been incorporated into the corporate culture that you have built up. But you've done it in a deliberate fashion. And that's how when you provision employees in the right way and you create the right roles and responsibilities that over time you start delegating things up and you find yourself with less and less to do. And so you start getting that boredom, which is good for a CEO. You want CEOs to be bored. So they're thinking creatively, like where else can I make money? And that is how this works. So you're constantly at the top with the, with the CIO and the CEO. You guys are dreaming up crap and it's filtering down to the appropriate employees and you're just making money. And that's how you run a successful business. Your competitors in the MSP world are just hiring more techs at whatever they can buy them at and they're throwing them at problems. Yes. You're yes. creating holistic solutions that are making clients happy and it's scalable. So... This scale feels so well. <laughs> I know this because I've worked at large, large companies. It scales well. And when done right, it takes a while, but you reflect your personality and your own unique way of doing things into the company. That's how we get these nice boutique shops who scale real well is because they were deliberate about provisioning employees. This is a really important topic. It may be boring. Our tenants a little low today because I think people thought, oh, provisioning employees. <laughs> but it's, it's a good one. And I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of people watch this video later thinking, yes, I need to do that. That's what's going wrong. And the top indicators that something is going wrong is you're constantly missing deadlines, you're always overworked, and you're burning out employees left and right. That means that you are not provisioning correctly. It means you do not have a appropriate matrix set up. And I don't care if you're one person or 100 people, that problem is universal and it is fixable. It's just not fixable by throwing more people at it. Yeah. All right. That's all I had to say about that. Thank you for everybody uh, for coming on and we'll see you all next week. Mm -hmm. See you guys.